Good morning, everyone. And as I said yesterday, welcome, all of you. On behalf of the uh, department uh, at the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council, yesterday many things were explained. We discussed uh, different initiatives that were presented, and we spoke about what is done under the umbrella of Etor Zuna Eraikis. We spoke about different uh, projects, and we didn't have uh, an opportunity to participate much. But today's the right day to listen to others. What we had experts, we will be listening to because they will be sharing with us what they've seen and observed over the last two days. So they're going to be sharing with us their point of views, the points of view, their opinion. And after this, I will open up the floor in order for you to ask questions and uh, make a comment. So therefore, we're going to be holding a panel discussion. And uh, there is um, there's going to be also a Zoom connection later. So Javier Hernandez, uh, Yolanda Mar and Jordi Serrano, please come up on stage. Bueno, pues si os parece, empezaré con las So uh, let me begin with the introductions. Please feel free to add things if um, I leave something out. So let's begin with Javier, Javier Hernandez from Madrid. He is a doctor in electronics and uh, he also studied um, company management, and he also uh, worked in the area of mergers and acquisitions in different uh, countries and different universities. He's got a broad experience. He's been to universities like the Michigan University, Harvard School, and uh, others. He was founder of the first uh, microchip uh, company in Spain. So much is being said about microchips uh, right now. Well, I don't have any, by the way. <laughs> uh, and he's an expert in high potential uh, uh, development uh, companies. Right now, he's global manager of MNI uh, Corporation and the founding uh, uh, partner of a consultant uh, consultants uh, company. And I'm sure I've left many things out, but I think that I've said the most important things. So I'd like to hand the floor over to you. So you may tell us what uh, really caught your attention about the things that were shared and presented yesterday. So good morning all of you. In the end, when we read CVs, sometimes I look to the left and right because I never remember I've been to so many places or done so many things. So it sounds as if you weren't speaking about me. I'd like to start with a disclaimer. Re re disclaimer regarding what we experts are going to do here because we've been asked to criticize and well in a positive manner or to give our opinion about uh, the uh, Kizuna Raikis uh, program and about the last uh, five years and the work uh, that's been uh, done. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very comfortable position to come here and speak about what others have done. And I said that uh, this would be a disclaimer, and that is that uh, this is all about execution. That is, it all has to do about the execution. And here, 
we see people who for the last uh, five years have been executing things. So the first outcome that must come out of this reflection is um, um, is to acknowledge and thank the people uh, who've been working in this area, especially taking into account the pandemic. Uh, so regardless of our opinions and regardless of the different uh, points we may be uh, raising, uh, we also want to be humble and to recognize that everything that's been done so far is wonderful. So once this said, I would like to start by looking at the definition of the terms. Uh, some of us wanted to speak about sustainable economy, and uh, somehow I think it would be interesting to see what it is we all mean uh, when we speak about sustainable economics or economy, because these terms sometimes uh, sound ambiguous, ethereal. We speak about innovation. We freely speak about innovation. We freely speak about social, social economic models, or perhaps we do so in uh, an ambiguous uh, fashion. So, uh, looking for uh, an accurate uh, definition, we can speak about uh, people's uh, well-being based on uh, responsible use of resources. And I think that the most important thing is uh, well-being for the people or uh, peoples, of course, there may be differences because depending on what people we're speaking about, of course, what uh, is well-being for some is not the same thing than for others. But in the end, what we are, what we've been is to speak about the challenges and the different um, action lines that have been uh, followed. If we were to um, uh, assess something would have to draw like a chart and uh, have a Y and an X axis. Uh, and when we speak about sustainable value creation, there are four or five uh, concepts which uh, normally uh, we uh, handle when we are speaking about value creation. First of all, a very important thing is the idea of long term. Anything that ends up being sustainable must uh, include the idea of uh, long term. It's uh, good to know this because in certain uh, areas, this is difficult to translate into reality. Uh, uh, a long term uh, used to be four or five years, and then next year it would be three years, and then two, whatever. And uh, in the business world, I'm not going to tell you what uh, long term is. Thank God, or unfortunately, there are many more private companies than uh, listed companies. And in uh, listed companies, uh, we speak about quarters. And now we are ending Q4, and perhaps we could start with a budget uh, for Q1. And uh, summer 2022, well, we don't know where we will be in summer 2022. So therefore, mixing the concept of uh, sustainability with the industry is one of the m most important challenges we're facing from the point of view of management even. There are many company decisions that are me being made uh, uh, with the no, short term, for the short term, and when we, but when we want to have a specific investment with a net year payback, 
period, people will look at you and say, listen, there are many chances uh, that in eight years time you won't even be here. So this is something we need to bear in mind. And the second most important concept out of the five concepts that I mentioned earlier, the second most important concept regarding sustainability is that somehow this uh, needs to be embedded in the strategy. It's got to be a part and parcel of a strategy. We cannot understand sustainability and please let me simplify this because the corporate social responsibility uh, department uh, uh, that sometimes uh, purchases a, a solar panel in order to uh, uh, place it in the uh, parking lot in order to uh, charge your cars. Well, this is not sustainability. I know this is all about having an electric vehicle, but a strategy must include sustainability as a part of the decision power, um, decision making power, because if it's uh, just a trend, if it's just a fashion, something I must have, uh, have it, we don't end up generating the drive a company needs in order for it to be sustainable. And there are some uh, similar concepts, some uh, things. For instance, at the end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s, we have the ISO standards. We said, listen, you know, we need to uh, be ISO certified. Uh, and, uh, no, I have quality. I do things very well. Everything I do is done with quality. But no, listen, it's not that uh, a uh, no uh, just has to uh, visit you. But the first uh, question they ask is, where is what is it you want to eat? Well, uh, uh, well, I need to audit a company in the vast country. I'm sure I'm going to be uh, enjoying some uh, great lunches. So we've learned with time that quality must be part and parcel of a strategy. It's not something that's just associated to a sticker or to a label they may uh, give us. And the same thing applies to, say, to sustainability. It's going to become a part and parcel of in organizations. And if that is not the case, we won't be able to have or to achieve or reach a sustainable ecosystem. <laughs> and the other three aspects uh, uh, make just make uh, plain sense, for instance, uh, collaborative things. Uh, when we speak about sustainable economy, it means that uh, everybody's involved. It's not just having the greenest company or the most inclusive companies. If it's the company, we have a problem. Uh, we've got to speak about the uh, economy, economy. We need uh, to work in collaboration and just and obviously there's got to be leaders and uh, an important uh, influence of uh, drivers in other uh, and uh, this is done with uh, a good communication and transparency and this is what this uh, conference is about uh, this is about uh, showing and sharing what is being done because if you do things but people don't know you uh, you do them it's uh, useless. So the collaborative uh, concept or the idea of uh, persuading others in order uh, for them to join, well, this is uh, fundamental. So these five concepts, and just to um, get down to business when we speak about uh, what this uh, program means, and uh, after seeing what we've seen, after witnessing what you shared with us yesterday, first of all, I'd like to speak about the challenges we're facing and about part of the different options that uh, are them assessing challenges. And by the way, uh, going back to the disclaimer at the beginning, please let me focus on those things that could be improved. And uh, of course, I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to patronize, uh, but uh, because uh, the first principle is engineering. The first principle in engineering is if something works well, don't change it, leave it. And uh, therefore, we need to. Uh, and from the point of view of challenges, Javier was speaking about the demographic challenge. He spoke about the ever changing environment we are operating in. Uh, innovation, the non-product innovation, or uh, triple uh, transition, energy, social, technical, 
transitions, one of the first things we should do is to is to start sorting things and uh, speak of two different types of uh, two different types of uh, challenges that we must uh, approach uh, with and in different manners. There are challenges uh, that uh, happen that uh, for just uh, uh, come up and there's nothing we can do about them. First of all, there's the demographic thing, and then there's the uh, volatile uncertainty, VUCA, uh, complex and ambiguity. I don't know. VUCA. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm just trying to have the interpreter. Well, thank you, says the interpreter. <laughs> uh, I am. Uh, unfortunately, these are things we're not going to be able to change. Uh, we won't be able to change the challenge. Kipuzkoa in, uh, in a very few years uh, will have the population. It will have, unless we organize uh, uh, coaches or buses from uh, areas in Spain that are empty and bring people here. So uh, the population, the pyramid is going to be uh, well, who knows? Well, so in five years' time, we'll have we'll need to manage uh, whatever is happening. Then things will be easier because when every decision tr decision tree uh, has branches, so you're going to have to manage uh, an environment with the next pyramid, and obviously you're going to have to set up uh, certain policies or handle certain uh, policies in order to provide. Uh, 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 whichever uh, services are needed for uh, the population. And then uh, the non-product uh, evolution and transition, these are challenges we can act upon in order to change them. That is, we cannot change uh, Gipuzkoa's uh, population pyramid, but we can change the size of companies. We can set up uh, companies that will make this challenge uh, uh, disappear. Obviously, you won't be able to uh, do away or get rid of the aging uh, challenge because it's a, a, a positive sort of challenge. Uh, life uh, uh, expectation. Uh, expectations are uh, growing, uh, life expectancy. Uh, so these are uh, challenges, and there are other challenges that are much more uh, complex because uh, we need to see where it is we want to be if we don't want to find ourselves in that uh, challenging situation. That is, uh, if uh, if we decide that we don't want to be in an environment uh, made up by small companies, we're going to have to decide what sort of company we want to have. Um, what are we going to be when we don't have small companies? Um, are we going to foster build-ups uh, among uh, Gipuzkoa companies in order to generate uh, certain mm, uh, clusters? Or, or uh, that uh, listed. Maybe that could be an idea to. Um, uh, so, so first of all, you need to decide the goal, and then you need to uh, do everything that's necessary in order to execute the challenge you've uh, decided on. First of all, we need to agree on what it is we want to become when we uh, grow up. And um, especially in the environment we're in. Because uh, once again, we are speaking about long term versus short term. This is a. Uh, so this was a. Uh, from the point of view of uh, challenges, sometimes we put everything in the same basket. And when it comes to executing things, this has to do uh, with how we implement things, uh, with how we roll out uh, certain things in the next environment, because the uh, next environment is just a uh, experiment. It's nice to um, run experiments, but we're just trying out things in order to uh, keep the best 
it's not just trying things out just for the sake of it. Uh, uh, it's not just uh, looking back and say, well, we're the same, even though we've uh, tested 26 different things. Well, maybe you shouldn't have. I don't know. Uh, maybe in a few years' time, we should uh, say we've uh, tried out 27 things. Uh, 26 uh, were no good, but finally we kept one which was excellent. So obviously we need to uh, decide uh, which uh, challenges we want to face. In the end, challenges uh, must be, we must be able to roll out uh, these uh, challenges and we need leadership. And the difficult thing about leadership at present is uh, putting together uh, long with a sh short term uh, uh, leader, a great leader and the winner will be the leader who can uh, persuade and convince his or her stakeholders, whether they be investors or citizens and voter or voters or um, people in the ecosystem. That is, uh, a great leader will be the great leader, will be the leader who will be able to bring together uh, short-term and long-term interests. There are great leaders in the short term, there are great leaders in the long term, but good people, people, brilliant people who can sell um, uh, a vision uh, for the long term and uh, execute it in the short term, in the short run, that is a great leader. Activities. I would like to focus on strategic projects. Mobile Siur in Basque and the various programs that were presented yesterday and a point that is very positive indeed and a series of areas that can be uh, reviewed. The essential part is specialization. At the end of the day, this concept of specialization on specific domains would, would be it a cyber, security, aging, mobility, whatever. Digitalization, digitization, in, in, in fact, it's how we do things. In Spanish, we, we have uh, proverbs saying that if we want to cover a lot, you're going to do a lot. And very ambitious countries have focused on digitization. So if you want to buy a watch, you go to Switzerland. I don't know if Swiss watches uh, give uh, the time better. Otherwise, you can go to Taiwan and buy a chip there. Specialization, it's a very important and positive part. And I believe that strategic uh, projects have always been based on that. Talking about the disadvantages, I think that the essential part that I would like to to underline here is that, in fact, in, in sustainable economy, the key word is ecosystem. We like to use the word ecosystem. And when we do presentations, we have the ecosystem and then logos on your slide. The ecosystem appears from the basis, from the bottom line with reference centers, with a political commitment of several institutions, in this case, the provincial government. And it uh, emerges from specific centers that were set up here for many years, universities, R&D centers. In the local ecosystem has a failure because it needs to uh, include the VOC, voice of customer, to include customers in all our reflections. Not just the conceptual customer from the uh, um, business point of view. It's the user who is justifying and who's paying the party of what we are doing. I will give you more material examples. We have a reference center called Mobile. From the technical point of view, I can certify that in, in Europe it's difficult to find a place like Mobile. 
in, in our American company, whose headquarters are in Chicago with presence in the Silicon Valley and China, we came to Mobil for our tests. So from the technology point of view and the capacities point of view, what we have here in our territory, we are very, very good. The problem is, and I was mentioning this to a colleague, is that we cannot, we do not know how to sell what we do, we the Basques in general, because we're too humble. Oh, I don't know why. Because we think too small, we think in small. And this complaint uh, re regards the countries in, around the Mediterranean. We, can, we do not know how to sell ourselves. Well, you can have Italian oil and then French wine. And then you, re, you, we don't know how to sell ourselves. And this lack of sales means that we don't have the right connections and the c customer ecosystems of other areas like Israel, Silicon Valley, the, and the Central European area. So I would invite reference centers to include in their ecosystem customers to include the final customers and final market. Otherwise, we are very good at what we do. We're very, very much specialized. We have high capacities. We can offer very good services to local companies. But then, what happens? This is not replicated in the results and in the sustainability of local companies because we don't know how to sell ourselves. We have resources that are the envy of part of the world, but Unfortunately, it doesn't give us the profitability to maintain it in the long run. So apart from doing this bottom-up reflection, let's see what we need. We set the top, we have this center, and then we'll see what we can do with it. We need to do this top-down reflection. Where, where's the world? Where are the requirements of the world? And then do the matching. That's essential. And then I'll link this to um, are my last two concepts, and then I will shut up. The first concept is R&D versus innovation. If I give you sheets of paper and you can give me the definition of, def of innovation, I will have many, many different answers. But it's clear, innovation is all things new that have a res an effect on your results in a positive way, with very positive effects and impacts on your result. Javier spoke yesterday about R&D indicators of our environment. Th they are very good. It, in comparison, they're very good if we compare with other countries. Let's see uh, about uh, innovation indicators. How R&D is in turn helping us in our sustainable economy? How is it helping us to do the to have a long-term sustainability? Otherwise, people say, I invest a lot in R&D and my results are very good, but Nokia is investing much more than Apple in R&D. But we can't say that Nokia is more innovative than Apple. So let's change this mindset. Let's talk about innovation versus R&D. Because otherwise we are disconnecting ourselves from the results, from the economic results. And to end my talk, talking about innovation, here we are traditionally a territory for product innovation. We have a very good network of uh, technology centers, but uh, the Basque businesses, regardless of it, their size, uh, has a culture of development and a, cu a culture of new products. We just forgot about the, the two other elements of innovation, process and people's innovation. We forgot about that. The first innovation that should start in any process is people's innovation. It's very complex. Because at the end of the day, the people are at the center. We should start to work on people's innovation. This will lead us to the three basic agents, i.e. the sponsor, leaders, and stoppers. Here we have the sponsor, 
It could be a public institution, an administration, leaders. I think we have a lot of leaders in, uh, in the Basque country for 500 years now, <laughs> long history of leaders. And maybe we, ha we will find new leaders, people thinking in the short and in the long term. And then the stoppers. We know how they work. There are a lot of agents when you want to launch these new dynamics that do not agree with you and you have to manage stoppers. Well, let's do it. No, nobody said this is an easy task, but I would invite you to reflect. In this territory, think about people's innovation. These people, in turn, will be able to change processes within companies and businesses. This change will entail the concept of sustainability in our strategies. And, of course, and then we will have product innovation because we have a lot of talent and resources. The concept of talent, uh, there's a lack of uh, talent at the moment. We're not stupid. The problem is we have to find it, this talent. Yesterday you spoke about uh, the resignation, massive resignation in the US, but it's not just the case there. We need to find this talent, how we encourage these people to come to us? How do we uh, attract a new generations? What is the concept of work for them? We have to make it more attractive because we are from the older generation and we had to, we, what we had to do in, in our time. But now this tree has many branches and new branches. Thank you very much indeed. I think this is a fantastic project, Etor Kisuna Eraikis. And of course, uh, excuse myself because I speak too much. Thank you very much, Javier. Okay, let's uh, have the questions at the end of the round table. And I'd like to introduce you to the second speaker. She's Mexican. Yolanda is Mexican. She uh, has a great, she is graduating in, in Fulbright University. Um, information technology and she's also graduated in the u.s 15 years of experience in digital transformation she works for governments local and federal government in mexico and she has a private consultancy company with deloitte and she's been involved in various initiatives for the development of united nations and she's a, an expert on digitization designing digital transactional performance measuring mechanisms, etc., and I ICTs. She was the director in Mexico for the Unit for Digital uh, Transformation and coordinator of the National Transformation uh, Strategy in Mexico. She was a representative of the Inter-American Bank for Development in Chile. She's a consultant there. She's a member of the e University Council. You are working with the e University? Yes, I give master classes in uh, U.S. universities. That's true. And my doc, my PhD. Oh, you forgot my PhD. I did it in Spain. Oh, I have this short resume. I give you the floor, Yolanda. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation to be here in this exercise. I just got my PhD in the Universidad de Catalunya. I'm very happy because it was a great achievement for me. Thanks to the technology and the internet, I did my tele PhD, I, remote PhD. I'm fascinated. I, I'm here for just one day and a half and I learned a lot about you and it's very motivating, inspiring. We c come here, people with different backgrounds and with the humility that you showed, saying this is what we do and we want to improve. And this is very honorable and inspiring. And several, several um, ideas about what the authorities shared here, but also the partners in the ecosystem shared with us in the various panels. First of all, I'd like to reflect on the investment models. Yesterday, we visited the Mobility Center, and I was asking, 
where does the investment come? All the investment is public. Wow, it's impressive, but I said. And why don't you improve it? Why don't, don't you grow it more? Why don't you explore other financing mechanisms, public and private partnerships for more investment? But because you have the perfect conditions at legal, uh, the legal uh, level to innovate in this type of tools. I reckon I don't really know the financing structure in Spain. I don't know if your autonomy here uh, can uh, emit uh, green bonds. But in Mexico, we are the first state in Mexico to emit green bonds. Or And in Chile, Chile is a country with a very solid uh, economy in Latin America. And what was really attractive in green bonds was the uh, investment portfolio where we found mobility, uh, circular economic, economics. Uh, and we'd like to explore um, innovative, innovative uh, mechanism for self-financing for new partnerships. And I think this could be uh, sustainable in the long term. Many of the initiatives that we've known in these two days could be uh, preserved in the future. I would like to challenge you whilst uh, abiding by the law, of course, to explore the great capacity that you have to have more private and public partnerships, to grow it more, to be transparent in the eco investment models. But this in turn will allow you to grow this infrastructure because you are betting towards uh, high specialization. You have a great potential too in another area, the silver economy because you've measured this phenomenon. And I don't know if this has been shared in other uh, panels, but you can ha have a hub for uh, the silver economy services. You are very powerful there. I'm talking about all types of services, Gov government services. And I visited your website, and I see the open data um, website, the government website. You can do all. Uh, formalities online, so it's quite modern, it's quite sophisticated. You have a lab, and I, if I, I know my, my population is aging, people are, might, might be disabled, and I, don't, I would like to uh, have a, vo a voice command to the speaker of my computer so that I can have telemedicine services or to do uh, formalities. Many exercises are being set up, and I'd like to challenge to innovate. Um, you, you can do that with academia, with university. You have co-op labs, uh, models. Great of your, a greater number of capacities that you have as an institution can be fed with a uh, whole ecosystems of uh, entrepreneurs and new companies that can provide services for the, the care industry and the silver economy. And this for, uh, is meant for the next generation, that is analyzing big data, customizing experiences, accompaniment, of people so that the government is closer to the to the society in a very intuitive way and innovative way. I'd like to invite you to go along those avenues. I also reflected on another point here, how to capitalize a space that you already have through this model with reference centers, with the conversation spaces that you set up. And this is me me meant for the digitization of people. This ecosystem has to be offered to a population that is adult, but they need to be technical savvy. These people are not going to make programs, of course, uh, but they're going to harness all the benefits of a digital economy. What is the metaverse? <laughs> that What does, does it mean for people? It's meant to improve their quality of life. What are the services that are going to be present in the metaverse? Who is developing the 5G networks and what are the services? We're talking about mobility with 5Gs, zero latency. Having not only electrical vehicles, but autonomous vehicles in public transportation systems, and I do this parallel with France, because this is meant to break divides, break divides in people, in accesses, in security, etc. But there's a lot of innovation behind and around the number of services that can be provided in the future. So you have all the space. 
you have the reference center that I visited yesterday. Mm -hmm. You you can have hackathons for students, showing them all this technology so that they can develop new services. And after that, you will have startups with a lot of specialization in mobility, not only electrical, but autonomous, on 5G roads, etc. And I think you all have Everything is ready to get to the next level of sophistication, especially following this logic of startups, high specialization, 4Ds, attracting talent and hubs and young people. And in this part, I think, talking about creativity, I think there's a new boom coming for creative industries. It's called the orange economy. How to capitalize all the culture that is digital. This is a new space that can be opened here as a, your ecosystem to invite creators to have labs that allow, allow you to generate a new uh, digital generation with augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D in printing. I don't know if you've read um, books for uh, blind children and with the 3D um, printers, you can show the figures. If the, there's an elephant in the woods, you can read it in Braille. And with your hands, because you're blind, you're feeling the figure of the elephant in the forest. You can do it with 3D printing. So there's no limits. There's no limits for creative industries. And I think here you have an incredible space to uh, allow for these spaces and conversations with creators. Why do I stress the part of creative industries? Because it's associated with young talent. This is a beautiful city. I'm fascinated. Normally, I work in Madrid, in Barcelona. But when you start to go out from big cities, and this happens in all countries, you need to find your niche. And inviting through universities a lot of people for exchanges, for MBA, people from the MBAs, Woodcamp's uh, specialization is, uh, in the reference center for cyber security. So you can have to have networkings and people and new talent, young people that come here, people who will become big businessmen and women, big uh, university people, and they will come back where they where, where all began for them. So you need uh, spaces for connection, for mobility, sign in many agreements. So this room would be full of young people. I, I've seen something in your, on your website, a, pro, a program for intergenerational entrepreneurship. You gave money, a uh, bonus to promote this interconnection with other generations. And I think these policies are very interesting. This can be very disruptive and interesting. Finally, assessment. I didn't have enough time to um, browse on your website, but assessment is fun fundamental. Your evaluation. We have piloted 25 projects. Where is the pilot project that escalated really? Something that can be measurable. What is the, its impact? Something that has been transferred. How can we reinforce spaces like this one? Well, you need to measure what we've done. For me, it's not easy. You need to communicate and to sell more of these products because this exercise uh, is worthy. I think it's full of merit because you will diversify opinions because you will receive many opinions about the eco design of public policy. And I think that you need to assess and you, you need to share that with the beneficiaries of your policies. And I will stop uh, now for, for now. No, thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Now my third guest. Jordi Serrano comes from Catalonia. He is the mem founder for Future for Work Institute. He is a, it's an obs independent observatory. It's a think tank dealing with t trends and innovation for human resources. He was the con a consultant for various organizations for the um, apl application of these emerging trends in the world of human resources. And he was a professor in Spain, and he worked in the international consultancy company called Everest. He's the head of Factor Humain, 
uh, foundation with important businesses in Catalonia for good practice in human um, resources. And he uh, helps startups and other agencies linked to innovation in on the labor market. And he's the author of many articles and publications. Jordi, your turn. I would like to, well, I'm the last speaker, but um, everything has been said. But I do agree with my colleagues. Uh, you've done a full uh, work, which is it's quite uncomfortable for me to do an assessment in just one day. Congratulations for your work, for your efforts. When I've seen these indicators in Gipuzkoa, in this province, and when I see that you are very good at different levels and indicators, I think it's uh, to merit to do more, to want to do more, because it would be easy to be complacent. I loved this initiative because you have this long-term vision, the experimentation uh, side to it, experimenting new models. I, I appreciated that. But I would like to focus now on my specialty, that is the work of the future. And then the special attention to one of the lines that you chose and that you identified as one of the most important for you in the future. I was uh, really pleased by the people's participation in companies. It's a differential indicator in the Basque Country, indeed. It's really spectacular what you have here. And in, I was told about your experience in MIT, in Boston, in fact. So you have a spectacular results here, and this is a key point, and you need to continue working on that. I also appreciated the fact that you've identified your focus. Your focus is on leadership, the ownership. Because sometimes we are left to good intentions, but the ownership and the managers and the owners should be involved. And you're talking about non-product innovation. You're talking about digitization. Transformation is about culture. It's about people, not just products. It's not just about products. Innovation is much more. And here you're very good at product innovation, but you need to uh, widen the scope. Then you, uh, how to attract talent here in the Basque Country and in the province of Guipúzcoa, more particularly. What is happening in the rest of the world and in Spain too is that digital talent is being put in, in, into big black holes, Barcelona and Madrid, big in, in big cities. That's where people go, that's where people is where companies are it's like a black hole it's growing it's growing it's growing it's eating all the talent so it's it's easier to go there you said Gipuzkoa is like a, a small village a, a, a village in china that needs to compete against these two black holes madrid and barcelona and many other cities in the world of course so covid 19 has also opened a door here for the first time, this talent, digital talent, is now global. And that's really interesting. People from Barcelona and Madrid are now working for companies in the US, in London, etc., remotely. And companies here can, in turn, attract talent from abroad. So suddenly, this physical need of being present of living in, in big cities, th this is dissolved. It's uh, it's disappearing. You spoke about the great resignation phenomenon in the US, and which is happening, especially for digital talent, because they can they can do it. They can resign, no problem, because demand is very high. And suddenly, with COVID nineteen, what happened? This talent is now global. For good and for, and for bad, in the Canary, Canary Islands, there are a series of initiatives there that in order to attract new people, new talent, to attract Germans, 
or English people or Americans, and they are inviting them to go to and work in the Canary, Can Can Canary Islands. And you're going to continue to work with your multinational, but you can live here and you can be more, you can be happier here. The digital world has no borders. And then the purpose of work. I I know it's very it's important for you to speak about the sense and the purpose of work. And normally, it's not associated to this type of innovation, but here so people can understand it better. You need to speak about impact. Today, the debate on the future of work is about the need of reskilling, recycling skills. And the first uh, panelist mentioned that the need to recycle and, and to reskill people who come from the uh, from the past economy. We need to give more agility to companies without losing the scope and the, the, the meaning of work and what it means for, for people. But we need to be more focused towards the immediate needs of recycling and um, uh, reskilling and automation challenges. Maybe this would be better understood if uh, the efforts were put into uh, reskilling people. And then I would, I would like to share with you the um, weaknesses that I identified in your projects. We are in a world of paradox. You need to balance all the elements around. It's quite difficult to have a clear strategy towards a single point today. I see two paradoxes here. You spoke about specialization, but specialization is important. I know that, but restress appeared in the horizon 2020, but in 2021, things have happened that were not foreseen. I'm not an expert, but between specialization and how can we balance that with resilience of people? That's the word in 2021. People don't speak about agility anymore. People, people speak about resilience, the ability to survive. Uh, under radical changes. How do you combine uh, what, uh, doing what you do, the exploitation of what you do, that is uh, smart specialization and exploration of what's coming? Because we don't know what's coming. Yolanda Menz mentioned metaverses. And if what specialists are, are right, it's the next internet generation. That's metaverse. Uh, three years ago, we didn't have Metaverse as a specialization. Should we have someone in research in metaverses? Between uh, creating a fish bowl where we're going to have uh, specialized fish, all of them very good. We're going to have sardines, we're going to have cods, etc. Or just uh, uh, putting in a ship uh, boat and letting. Uh, uh, and, uh, and allowing for the creation of an ecosystem. So this is like a balance and equilibrium, and we need to see how we do th how to do this. And I see you guys in specialization. And uh, before I finish, I'd like to mention another thing, and that is to and lo dejo para el final porque digo no sé si si me atrevo a decirlo, ¿no? Pero está como and uh, the idea is to see how to balance the land orientation as the government um, fostering this and there's also the need for opening that, that is the need to open to innovation how do we combine uh, the material part with the immaterial part I think there's um, you need to tell you need to tell what you guys are doing you need to do this better how do we attract the people from outside Gipuzkoa because you speak about Gipuzkoa a lot and not even about the Basque country 
and uh, how do you, how are you going to be attracting people from outside uh, Gipuzkoa? Yesterday we spoke about the need of companies getting together in order to compete against uh, China and to get a contract. How do we make a Catalan company? Uh, co how, how, how do you make them, do you convince them so they'll decide to come to San Sebastian because San Sebastian is going to be like the Silicon Valley uh, here. So, and if we don't do this, we run the risk of, um, of not generating the scale we need. Uh, we need uh, we need to have some sort of uh, Dallas. You need to tell what you're doing. You need to communicate. Uh, I've seen this with uh, Mondragon, and uh, actually, I found out about it in Boston. Uh, for instance, an anecdote. Last night, I went out for a walk, and uh, well, I need to see this uh, Peña del Viento thing. Uh, uh, and it was dark, it was eight or so. Uh, and I started walking and it was getting darker and darker. And all of a sudden, I reached a point where it was black. I couldn't see anything. Uh, I love stars watching and everything and uh said so, well this is uh, one of the key monuments in san sebastian it's a monument called uh el peine de los vientos uh, the comb of the winds uh um, so um, it was dark, I couldn't see anything. So I'd like to end by saying you need to throw some light on what you do. That is, you know, to light. You need to light what you do or else uh, nobody, el nobody will be able to see it, to see where they're going. You need to light uh, up the way. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome our fourth speaker. Uh, making use of uh, digitization and the good thing about uh, uh, um, technology. So all of a sudden we're going to uh, jump to Montevideo in um, Uruguay. And our speaker has a master's degree from the Louvain uh, Catholic University. He's been a professor in industrial uh, engineering at the University of the Republic for more than 20 years until 2015. He has worked as a consultant, senior consultant in the national uh, setting, in uh, public and private uh, settings. And uh, he is, He's also advised in uh, productivity, competitiveness, and financial systems. He's advised uh, many different governments like Uruguay, uh, Par Paraguay, Panama, Honduras. He's published many articles around uh, competitiveness, promotion, and productive. In August 2011, he took on the position a position at the Ministry of Finances in Uruguay. And then in 2015, he became uh, Deputy uh, Secretary uh, of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Relations. Now he's a um, lead strategy advisor of the American uh, state organization. I don't know if the connection is ready with Uruguay. He doesn't seem to be connected yet, but in the meantime, yes, I guess he is there. Hello, wonderful. Just in time. Uh, Luis, it's a pleasure to have you here. I've already introduced you. I'm sure I've left many things out, but uh, I'd like to welcome you warmly, even though this is going to be a virtual encounter or meeting, 
but perhaps uh, you could give us uh, some feedback regarding what it is you've been able to analyze and what you've uh, seen and heard so far in the last two days. And perhaps you could tell us, perhaps uh, you could give us some feedback regarding what, uh, what, uh, where it is you think we could improve. Thank you very much, Nay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for your invitation. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate you. If you allow me, I'm going to be sharing a screen. And in the meantime, I'd like to go back to the words uh, by Javier when reading my CV. Uh, uh, I'm getting older, so I don't remember all the places I've been to, so I'm going to speak about the different uh, uh, hats I've worn. Maybe a, a vice minister of economy and finances, because obviously I had to face many of the problems you guys are facing. But uh, I'd also like to go back on some of the challenges that you people are also facing. And I'm going to be saying three things. First of all, some introductory uh, remarks in order for you to see, in order, in order to tell you uh, how I see what you guys are doing. Uh, I'd like to tell you how I understand and how I see things when I look at uh, public policies. And I'm also going to uh, raise some uh, doubts because, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend your meeting in person. So, so I'm going to mention a few doubts as to whether you guys are doing some things or you're not doing some things, some, uh, a few things. So, and finally, I'd like to tell you that yesterday I very much enjoyed Javier's presentation regarding leadership and ownership. First of all, your first few remarks. Well, I'd like to say that uh, growth, uh, uh, environmental, social, uh, growth and sustainability, all these have uh, feedback effects and complementary effects. Uh, sometimes there's a trade-off between these values. First of all, uh, without inclusion, growth generates a loss uh, of social capital, cohesion, and social acceptance. So without uh, environmental sustainability, uh, growth uh, generates uh, loss of natural capital and uh, natural resources, and this uh, hampers future growth. And this also generates uh, intra-generation uh, conflicts. In order to ensure environmental sustainability and social uh, and, uh, environmental social sustainability in an intergeneration uh, level, we need to uh, have a new activity portfolio with new products, processes, resources, and institutions. The w most uh, broadly used uh, term is uh, transitions. Uh, how can we finance, how can we fund uh, transitions? Without growth, we cannot fund, we cannot finance transitions. So in order to go towards a sustainable economy, one uh, faces what we sometimes, uh, uh, what we, those uh, who worked on public policies, had to uh, face. The famous uh, uh, Chinese uh, platter uh, game, because uh, targets uh, are difficult. So, for instance, uh, we can no longer say that we need an instrument or a tool for one uh, strategy. Uh, and let me give you some example. Uh, one needs to grow, but not too far in order, or not too much in order not to damage the environment. So uh, we need uh, growth, but also inclusion and the environment. We must make sure that uh, we take care of everything. Um, and this is one of the first uh, points I'd like to raise. 
as an introduction in order for you to to see or in order for you to understand how I understood what you guys are doing. The second thing is that uh, public uh, policies problems are not all the same. Uh, if, uh, there are other problems that are more complex. A cause that has an impact on B, that has an impact on C, and that goes back to A. This is more difficult, and here we need many studies, many models, but, but in the end, uh, we can solve things by saying, well, I need to act on A, F, and C in order to uh, help B. But there are some problems that are more complex, and that is when the interaction between A and B can uh, generate uh, C or D. And this is what happens with the problems that you guys are, are facing. These are complex uh, problems. And, and the dynamic of the interactions between uh, everybody uh, may be good or bad. So we need to be very careful with governance. You guys are doing things very well with the idea of uh, Gipuzkoa listening to everybody. This is a wonderful initiative, not just to build an agenda, not just to design or implement an agenda, but also in order to build consensus and also for a democratic uh, uh, governance. Uh, and I anticipated, or perhaps, uh, well, but the idea is uh, for us to understand the problems or how important governance is. One of the greatest problems with uh, conflict, complex problems is that sometimes we have external shocks or internal changes in society that leads to a change in objectives and goals. Another problem has to do with the Chinese uh, platters or uh, dishes that I mentioned. The, uh, there's the thing of the assets in the region, and we need to establish a balance between different assets. There are active human, social, physical assets, and then we have a return on this. This is why I spoke about human and natural capital. The third thing in order to approach these problems is that we need a good governance. We need to know who the agents, uh, who the uh, agents involved are who the uh, stakeholders involved are. Sometimes citizens don't act. They just receive the benefits brought about by public care policies. And there are stakeholders on the national and international level, sometimes uh, who uh, share objectives, sometimes uh, uh, these uh, goals are in conflict. Uh, Xavier spoke about the short term and the long term. And in reality, there are uh, are many more terms, not just short and long. Think about uh, private uh, companies. What's the period for investment uh, return or recovery? Sometimes this happens in just two, three months. Some uh, investments are recovered in five years. Some uh, investments are recovered in 10 years. An energy plan takes, uh, for instance, 15 years. So the investment return or recovery periods are different. And a company is a uh, set, overlapping set of uh, investment recoveries. And investment is a distribution of all these things. What one needs depends, or depending on the investment, is the predictability, the forecast. If one has, for instance, if you can uh, think of a five or 10 years uh, term, you may have investments that will be recovered in five or 10 years. If things uh, keep uh, changing, as it happens in many countries around us, then companies prefer, prefer investments that can be recovered uh, fast. And this uh, uh, damages the long-term uh, growth of economies. So the similarities between uh, timely uh, uh, investments and investments uh, matter when it comes to solving the conflict, conflicting uh, objectives. On the other hand, we need to look at the uh, factors. Uh, we need to look at uh, the uh, foundations 
of this uh, growth? Basically three. First of all, we have institutions, whether they be formal or informal. Uh, formal ones are laws, decrees, etc. Uh, and informal ones are social norms, how people behave. And this is based on people's beliefs. And yeah, I'd like to say that uh, in the Basque Country and in Gipuzkoa, there are many things that have to do with these informal institutions, this uh, spirit of uh, cooperation, this community uh, spirit that strengthens the uh, fabric and uh, uh, democratic governance and social capital. And then we have uh, capacities and skills, human, social, uh, cultural education, and then third, the public assets that generate externalities, uh, uh, public debate generates uh, uh, positive things. So what is the main problem? And that is that uh, nothing comes out of, uh, out of the blue. Uh, we mustn't be complacent with oneself because what uh, is successful in Gipuzkoa right now mustn't or doesn't necessarily have to be a success in 20 years' time because growth is always uh, threatened. So is uh, 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 equality and sustainability. But there's another important thing, and that is the temporary solution. These uh, things evolve more slowly than reality does. In the last uh, five years, we've been seeing a uh, revolutionary change from the point of view of uh, technologies, because the institutions we're living with are the same than uh, uh, 50 or 30 years ago. From the point of view of formal things, and social norms or beliefs. Right now, we are debating on the norms or rules that will regulate this uh, digital revolution. Uh, how is everything going to be regulated? Right now, we see phenomena, but institutions don't uh, move, don't mobilize. And the same happens with uh, skills with capacities. And the same thing happens with uh, public uh, assets, things, infrastructures. It takes uh, 10, 15 years to build a road. But a company needs accessibility tomorrow because uh, uh, so these are the problems that uh, these, are the, these are the things I've seen when looking uh, and when uh, following the presentations, uh, and this is how I analyze, uh, this is, uh, well, I'm not going to spend time in uh, the things you said yesterday, and I, uh, I once again like to say that I couldn't go deep into details because I wasn't able to be there in person, so many of the comments perhaps uh, are not uh, that I could make are not applicable. So this is why I'm just presenting certain doubts. Uh, because if the uh, doubts are confirmed, these uh, could become recommendations. And finally, challenges that have been identified, at least from what I see that is happening on an international level and on the level of China, Europe, and uh, the American continent. And the first doubt is, if we've, uh, you've got, you guys have identified interdependence between challenges, objectives, and uh, different uh, compensation mechanisms. Uh, one of the transitions has to do with uh, digital transformation, but the other one is the green ecologic uh, transition. Uh, uh, mining linked to blockchain is extremely intensive in energy use. So um, they, all this, uh, 
for instance, companies may generate problems regarding sustainability in the use of energy. All these things are interrelated. So when one supports a digital transformation, we must also think about what is being doing we're being done with ecological uh, transformation. These are, things are interdependent. So the question, the doubt is whether these things have been identified. If these things have been identified, perfect. If not, then we have to look for this sort of interdependence in order to see uh, uh, how we're going to do things and uh, how fast each uh, transition is going to take uh, place. Uh, the second doubt has to do with whether there's a system to anticipate to shocks. And this is something that we saw with the pandemic. But it's not just the pandemic. In 2008, we went through the financial crisis. And in a few years, perhaps we're going to uh, have another shock. Uh, the world has become uh, tremendously interdependent. Anything that happens uh, somewhere in the world uh, generates a butterfly effect that will affect us. Uh, so we're all subject to outside shocks. And this is where we start seeing these uh, concepts, these ideas that Jordi mentioned, things like resilience. And I'd like to uh, 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 I couldn't listen to all the speakers. I, I couldn't follow all the speakers because I had a problem with uh, Zoom. I'd like to apologize. When there's an outside and external shock, one always wants to know if we can uh, go back to uh, the pre-shock situation. And this is something that can be studied, that can be measured. That is, which are the factors that reduce the chances of uh, going back to the pre-shock uh, levels. And this is what we call vulnerabilities and which are the factors that increase the chances of uh, going back to the pre-shock uh, 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 levels. And this is what we call a uh, resilience uh, capacity. Have you guys uh, used the pandemic in order to analyze the vulnerabilities and the resilience capacity of homes and companies in uh, Gipuzkoa that will give you information in order to uh, design policies for the future in order to reduce uh, vulnerabilities. If you did, forget, uh, ignore this comment. And if you didn't, you guys should, in order to analyze, we should analyze uh, vulnerabilities and resilience uh, capacity because we are going to uh, uh, suffer other shocks. This is for sure. Gipuzkoa is going to suffer other shocks. Uh, aren't we all? As has been happening every five or ten years. So this is bound to happen again. So we'll have or we'll see disrupted uh, changes in the supply chain. All the digital transformation um, the people who work from Uruguay in Switzerland, uh, seeing disruptive changes in the supply chain, and we are being tremendously dependent on this uh, digital transformation, and we are subject to attacks. So nobody can say or nobody can ignore the fact that uh, there's going to be a shock in five or ten years, and one part of the world is going to stop because of uh, disruptive uh, changes or uh, problems in the supply chain. So there's bound to, we're bound to suffer uh, shocks. So we need to analyze the vulnerabilities of homes and companies. We need to know what the resilient capacity is. So these are the challenges uh, as regards work lines or I, uh, I'm very pleased and I very much appreciate and I very much like what you guys are doing. I love seeing people who, I love seeing people who work like you guys are working. You have very ambitious plans.
you have some very ambitious uh, plans. And these are things that uh, mobilize us. And, uh, and the doubt is, once again, is whether, well, and as to the doubt about this, well, is there a joint governance? And you have a criteria, priority definition criteria. If uh, resources, whether they be human, physical, social capital, are not enough, do you guys listen to each other? Do you get together with people, with stakeholders, uh, to discuss everything? This may generate fatigue. This, uh, so this may weigh you out. What if, uh, at a given time, you may you say, "Well, let's uh, end with the meeting because people are not attending. People are getting." are sick and tired of meeting of meetings. People would rather meet less often. So how or where, how are you going to prioritize? There are many projects with many strategic initiatives and uh, public capacity is needed in order to develop all these uh, projects. And uh, there's the risk of fatigue and this is where you need to define priorities. So the question is, yeah, uh, you have, uh, is there a joint uh, governance of all the initiatives? And uh, here I'm not referring to sustainable economy alone. I'm also referring to ecologic revolution, environmental revolution. And I see what you guys are doing, and it's spectacular, but there's this idea. And then when I look at sustainable economy, is this uh, coordinated with democratic uh, governance? Is, uh, I don't know, are you guys uh, coordinated uh, human resources in Gipuzkoa or social resources, uh, social capital resources? Uh, do you have criteria in order to identify uh, priorities or uh, if you have all this, my suggestion is for you to uh, identify priorities. As regarding monitoring, the first doubt is whether you have uh, identified the relationship between uh, uh, time horizons and actions and uh, uh, the expected results. An example could be decarbonization uh, versus growth. Uh, there's, is there an analysis uh, regarding how long this may take and how this will affect growth? Once we go, once again, we go back to the Chinese platters or uh, 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 plates. Uh, the idea is to try and see what the recovery. Uh, investment recovery times are and how you're going to manage all this. The second question, is there an early alert system? You have many goals. They are interdependent. As the examples that I mentioned, blockchain, digital transformation and energy, decarbonation and growth, they are interdependent. So this kind of independent their dependencies can mean that the nonconformity of one of these goals can be in a cascading set of faults and inconformities. So we should try to avoid that uh, the non-compliance of a goal impacts the rest. We need to have an um, early alert system to fight non-compliances and failures. What happens if this goal uh, doesn't succeed in two months in order to avoid the escalation and the cascading of new co non-compliances in order to avoid future impacts? Uh, question three, do you measure and monitor the evolution of assets? Do you have measurements for human capital in Gipuzkoa, natural capital, that is your human resources, your social capital, but I also mentioned the democratic capital in Gipuzkoa and the physical capital of your 
uh, institutions and companies. Why? Because it's important to use the Chinese dishes and make them turn. And it's important that both things are really uh, rooted in really data-driven approaches to avoid what happens in public mobility when somebody says, I want to play this, or I want to do that. We all have biases. And the only way to anchor uh, discussions or to reduce biases in public policy is to use this data-driven approach. So if you have measured that, just forget about my questions. Otherwise, this is my recommendation. And finally, I loved Javier's presentation and the importance he gave to leadership and ownership. Here, reflections uh, are with other hats in my case, not just as a vice minister for, of finance, but as someone who is observing what is happening in the um, um, Latin American continent, the identity group and ownership, and how networks, not social media, but the economic, uh, social, and uh, political networks work in each of the regions. Mm -hmm. First, uh, talking about leadership, the social change should start not w with leaders, but with leadership interventions, that is, with various people or various companies or several organizations, at the periphery of the economic fabric. Why? Each entrepreneur or each businessman or woman is the heart of a daisy, and the petals are the identity groups, the district, the school, where this person played football, where he went out. For me, uh, I, due to my age, I always uh, think about business men, but of course I should say business women too. Be, 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 I have problems with inclusive language, sorry, in my slides. But the example is that each of the business people that you have have different identity groups around the daisy petals, and this influences the person and his or her behavior. The business people are the intersections of different identity groups. When you need to work with uh, business people around the importance of workers' participation uh, about the future of work and the, and the purpose of work, the beliefs of these people are is, inf is influenced by the group groups that surround them. If you want to go towards in influencing leaders, people occupying the center of interest of the society, this is going to lead to the debate of ideas. And this debate can be polarized. This polarization can generate breakdowns in the social uh, capital fabric. You can't see it because you live in a fantastic region. We see it here in the American continent every day, all over the place, in all countries, how polarization affects the loss of social capital because there's a fight and struggle for ideas. And today, with social media, the, everything is polarized very, very quickly. It's difficult to depolarize because you are losing the means and the resources. It's difficult to change these trends. For this type of social change, it's better to start with the periphery, not through the leaders. Use uh, the small companies that are at the periphery that are not linked to influencing people. Work with these companies that are around, not in the center, because they give uh, the social sense, the social meaning, and the belonging, and it, because it gives the economic uh, meaning and scope for the future. To give more importance about your culture, the sense, and the purpose of work in the, the employees. And from the periphery, little by little, they will permeate and enter the center. 
and the leaders in the center will be influenced by the followers at the periphery. There are no leaders without followers. You need to empower the followers so that leaders and those who are going to fight with ideas do not influence the followers by polarizing the discussion. So my reflection here is don't think about the leaders. Think about interventions with leadership at the periphery of your economic fabric. And this. don't, don't think about a big company, which is the model at the center, because it's going to polarize the discussion. When it's done around the peripher peripheral fabric, it's easier because it's good, it's good practice, it's nitty-gritty, it's participation with all the, all the workers. And that's what you're looking for. My second reflection it refers to the right of ownership. You spoke about management and ownership of SMEs, capacities and beliefs, social change. It's not a, just a problem that you have. The problem of SMEs is because all the SMEs have all the hats. The hat of logistics, the financial hat, because these people in the SMEs go to, to bankers and they have the hat of the production because it's a family company. And they also have the hat of marketing, of sales, have all the hats and they are the owners on top of that. So it's not only your problem. I can't say how to solve it because somebody should have had this idea before me, but I think it's not a minor problem. It's an I ideal problem so that you work on your culture. Let, do experimentations. If you find the solution, I assure you that this is, will be copied in the whole world because it's a problem that all SMEs have in the world. Again, you could harness your cooperative culture that you have in your Basque country, which is very powerful. How to develop a associative project, not between SMEs only. The owner of SME will have to be the owner, but regarding uh, um, purchases, you that this person needs the cooperative. And for social uh, and human resources, there is a, the cooperative culture around. He is the, or she is the owner, but there is an association with the cooperatives around. Because a, a single person on top of an SME cannot solve all the problems because they're doing all things during the day. They have different roles. They are buying, they are selling, they're producing, and it's impossible to do everything. But let's investigate. You have the Gipuzkoa lab for that, which is spectacular. You can experiment and try to improve. And then there's another concern in your case. SMEs have problems when escalating. Well, I think it's not a bad thing. The right of ownership hides two rights. The usufruct right, which makes us uh, grow, because if you are the owner and you can um, get the return of the or the beneficial interest or usufruct, it means that you can grow. The right of usufruct or beneficial interest is within the ownership law and right. And this explains the growth of all economies where the ownership right is respected. The um, ownership right has another right, it is the exclusion right. If this is from A, it doesn't belong to B. So, it, if you get the returns, it's A and not B. This exclusion right explains inequalities in all economies where the um, ownership right is protected, except in societies in Gipuzkoa where the cooperative activity and community activities are so important, well, you find a lot of inequalities outside your territory. Why? Because the right of property has this uh, embedded exclusion right. When you escalate the size of companies, you can concentrate the right of exclusion. And we are seeing this in big firms 
that concentrate most of richness and wealth in the world. Very small firms concentrate the world wealth. So the fact that SMEs escalate can lead them to other problems. So they need to escalate without affecting equity and equality. And I go back to my previous point. Uh, it's with associations and cooperatives. In, uh, the firm can escalate in a community an associative or cooperative way, in such a way that the right of exclusion is not concentrated and that so that mm, profit is not in the hands of others. It's, this is not just your problem. Gipuzkoa Lab, for me, is a fantastic uh, idea where you can experiment. Or there's another alternative. Go towards a different model. Joint ventures with big companies. And research development is done in Gipuzkoa because you're a small territory and if the big firm loses money with this innovation it loses small a uh, small um, amount but if this uh, um, firm wins and earns more money then innovation in turn will be benefiting from that because the escalation level in the big one will have impact on the escalation level of the small companies in uruguay uh, we have three or four companies who, which do uh, high qualification jobs at uh, small levels but the big big um, companies with which they have joint ventures do escalate and develop at international level so it's a both ways and in, uh, b both directions benefit. These are my reflections. I'd like to thank you because lately I deal with problems of our continent for in human resources, democracy, security, safety and development. That's what I normally do. And for me, the, this is fresh air in Gipuzkoa. Uh, and then I had to abandon my nihilism. Uh, and for me, it gave a new value to politics, to public policy. Thank you very much indeed. And my congratulations for your work. Thank you very much, Luis. I'm happy that this was fre fresh air for you because you had to wake up very early again. So I'm happy that this was fresh air for you. And we have several minutes for questions. I have several. Yesterday, I didn't give you much time to speak. I don't know if uh, there are questions in the room. Yes, raise your hand first. I can repeat it through the microphone so that it can be translated and heard by others. Yes, you will use a microphone, otherwise people cannot hear you. Three people. Todas concentradas en esta zona. Thank you. My name is Mikel Orobengoa. We are associated to Mondragon Cooperatives. I would like to ratify one of the points that were mentioned by Javier regarding science, technology, and innovation and the need to uh, disaggregate. This summer I read a book by Mark Taylor, Policy, Politics of Innovation. He said one of the biggest problems of governance of science, technology, and information is that we are still under the paradigm of a model which is linear and mechanicist. If you do science, you go to technology, and this entails innovation. And he said that there are vast analyses and paradoxes for example, the case of uh, European countries, which are very uh, well advanced in science, 
but uh, however they never finish to f well they never end what they started in the case of austria sweden the france for instance in the case of spain we, we are very well ad advanced in publications but we are number 11 power in publications but we never finish what we started and he mentioned the case of sweden where the first minister, prime minister, he was tired of obtaining bad results in governance. He, they decided to separate. To, I have a scientific academic system that are very powerful. That's not where the, the problem is. I have a problem with innovation. So the prime minister segregated this and created an interministerial committee for innovation because science is well advanced in Sweden but not the rest they have the syndrome the syndrome of not obtaining results in the Basque case we have a problems of disaggregation Javier gave us yesterday some figures this territory has 2.4 percent of investment of its GDP in science and innovation but we need to disaggregate if we don't disaggregate we can't see the problems where they are on the one part, we mix the offer and the supply. If we analyze it in an accumulated way, science and technology and companies, to all together, we can't really see it. Because if we disaggregate, we reckon there are problems. One of them is that the demand has changed in investment of R&D in the Basque country by big companies has gone, has dropped by 33% in 10 years. However, demand and investment has increased by the SMEs. And we have a technology call offer that is there. If we analyze the, we analyze the plan of the Basque government, there was a clear goal We were uh, industrial research, which, which was, was very powerful. We had decreased our mm, technology development activities at the same time. In the, during this plan 2020, during this new plan, we couldn't turn this problem around. But the demand has changed. The SMEs does not, do, do not require that much industrial investment, but they are now requiring technology development. We need to make a systemic effort to d distinguish what is the effort in science, which is very noble, and then dif distinguish that from results. We need to realize what are the underlying impacts in this magma of science, technology, and innovation. Yes, you're right. I think it's a, a lack of agents, you have gaps. We know certain gaps. We we, we, not, we cannot solve that. You you see that Ikerlan has a lot of projects in a drawer, and uh, there are very bad projects in the drawer too. The problems that we have with projects that are in the drawer, the good ones, and I'm mentioning Ikerlan because it could be Technalia, it could be Theinto, and other cooperatives, Bertain, etc. etc. In fact, there is a lack of mm, technology transfer. We need more technology transfer. That's the basic gap. We are, uh, have a lack of agents, scarcity of agents. I had uh, a meeting with MIT investors, and they spoke about the generation new funds, the science equity. Investors who are ready to inve invest in the long term for technology, because generally most of um, investment funds are um, for, for the short term and very often it's very difficult to transfer R&D towards innovation. And then he spoke about the drawer and the bad projects in, in the drawers. So there's another gap. We need market traction. Uh, traditionally, we've done a lot of R&D by big companies on the basis of the subsidies, but these subsidies do define specific topics 
to be invested in. And finally, the only investments in those predefined areas. This is a derivation of the plan 2020. And in fact, it's always predefined to specific niches of investment. But in, at the end of the day, SMEs which are closer to the market, that if we compare it with big companies, they do not receive those subsidies. And they are now starting to need more traction, more driving force and more money. It's a, there's a gap of and a scarcity of agents. We need to solve these gaps. Thank you. Two more questions in the room. Can you use the microphone, please? Good, good morning. Thank you. My question is for Javier. I've understood that there are different phenomena on which we cannot act. And one of these imp impossible phenomena is the demographic pyramid. We cannot do anything. And I'm worried because we're, because one of my grandsons call, calls me white head. And from the political arena, we, can, we could be leading as a community with a long-term perspective. And in, you said that the demographic pyramid will be what it will be. We cannot do anything against that. Can we make it younger? I know it's difficult to have a younger pyramid. But when I hear that you said no, it's a pity. Of course, we can act on the pyramid. Yes. We can change the populational pyramid of a territory. It's brute force. <laughs> brute force or a uh, uh, better uh, type of action. But when you have a challenge as the size of your company, this is a, a challenge that can be exchanged with another action that is something that you can do in the short term to change the populational pyramid of a territory can it can be changed in fact there are mm, birth policies or attracting youngsters young, new talent to at attracting youth people mm, younger than 40 but i think that the effects of these policies to change a, a pyramid in a country of 700,000 inhabitants, it's not immediate. You, there are no immediate actions. It doesn't mean it, can it cannot be changed, but we can change the existing uncertainty with the geopolitical tensions between the US and China. I mean, we can't change that mm, from here. Can we do a concrete actions to change the disruption of the world supply chain? We cannot do that. We are small, we are limited in our effects here. Of course, you, we cannot act at global level from here, but we need to be more realistic regarding our goals. Sometimes it's wishful thinking. Sometimes we would prefer to have a younger territory, but it's not the case. The last question, yes, regarding the uh, attraction of new talent. It's a question and a reflection, in fact. The way we sell ourselves as Gipuzkoan people. We compete with the cities like Madrid and Barcelona. The dimension of our projects well, is quite similar. The dimension of projects, qu quite similar. So we need to give more value to uh, environmental factors, to attract talent, not to retain them. I was in another meeting and the speaker found a spectacular sentence. We shouldn't find to and uh, look for retaining people so that such a bastion is a stop for those who are in transiting along their professional lives. So they can have a stop for three or four years here in San Sebastian. Why not? We, because we cannot retain them for life. Giving value to the environmental elements, if we could compete with other cities which are bigger bigger than than me. Uh, I, ha I was trained in Fontainebleau in a business school in France. I could have gone to London, to Madrid, to Barcelona, to Milano, 
um, the, the approach in Fontainebleau was fantastic. They spoke about exclusivity, beautiful environment, networking, and that's what Gipuzkoa and Donostia should sell the environmental elements, when we go out from, from we, go, we go to the MIT or to Stanford, people are attracted, not by projects, but because of the place. Madrid and Barcelona are bigger than us, and here we can have other elements that to put on the table, apart from a project, but we can offer security of the city, families around, community, distances we, which are very short, quality of life here, sports for, for youngsters, for, for, for young families. These are environmental elements. We have very powerful uh, projects, Mugil, Mirargen, the hydrogen corridor. We, we need to give more importance to other elements to attract talent. We need to attract and return, retain these people for a specific number of years. Thank you. Jordi, yes, uh, this question is for you. I totally agree with you. Each territory will have to compete. Uh, and c the Canary Islands uh, say, come to us because we have very good weather and very fan and fantastic landscapes. But the idea of participation of companies, this is unique in your case. Come here. Come here because you're going to, be, going to be very happy, but you're going to be part of these organizations. You're going to be a key actor, and this is interesting, to sell your bus country. And this post-COVID scenario can allow you to attract people, but um, at the same time, you can still work for your London project, but come in and live here. Come here, but you will be uh, working remotely with uh, other projects in other places of the world. So people speak about you only live once economy. And many people are just thinking about moving. I, I can go to the Basque country because the quality of life is very high. And still I can continue to work for Amazon or for other companies in Madrid or Barcelona because I can uh, telework. Yes, I would like to add something. During the coffee break, I was talking with an MP here. She said that she knows a Mexican family who mo which moved here because they can um, work from here. They wanted a safer space for their children. I think there are many scenarios that allow you to, to attract people. In this recommendation, that is to innovate in investment mechanisms, there are many interesting projects like Startup Chile, saying these are here, we can diversify our uh, capital uh, with a new capital, because if you have women in, in your company, you have sandboxes, places to uh, have new technology, good education. You just you are only at one hour by plane to important capitals in Europe. You have a whole ecosystem that can attract new families, new people. At the various stages of their training, uh, you, ha you can have exchanges with students. If you're making a master program, you can have a super specialized pool of people during the MBA stage, and when you have professionals, uh, they are now having families and they want to settle. And you have a, a full range of possibilities to attract new people, and you need to, to action that, to, to be, do it more actionable. Don't obsess with young people. Don't get obsessed with young people. Because in Catalonia, uh, an, an area in Catalonia is competing with Barcelona. It's, for a youngster, it's, it's super interesting to go to a big city like Barcelona. It's difficult to compete. But demography is what it is. It, we are getting older. And at certain age, you give value to other things, not just to the big city. So the silver economy is here to help. Don't get obsessed with attracting young people. Being young doesn't mean being digital and being innovative. Yes. You were convinced. That's why you bought this product. And you, you bought this idea because you were convinced and persuaded. Problem is, we cannot sell what we have. We don't know how to sell our products mm -hmm. and our offer. 
Yes, I would like to insist on the importance of the information analysis. The example that you gave is linked to the fact that these are gravitational models. People go where people are. That's why they go to Madrid and Barcelona and have a bigger mass of people, so they're more attractive. But there's another a aspect. The factors that attract specific types of people, specific categories. In my, in my house, I have a plant that attracts specific uh, types of birds, but others. And so according to the plants you have, you will attract certain types of birds. What are your capacities in the Basque Country to attract specific types of birds or talent? You need to do correspondence analysis, given information. We've done it for products. As what are the capacities that are needed to ma manufacture specific products, to offer services? You need to analyze what you have and to attract specific birds. Let's see what are the public policies that have to be developed in order to sell your territory to at attract the talent that you want, the birds that you want. But because you think, ah, because he's young and then he's going to be very good here, but it's not always the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. You need a new policy to attract people working in software. And that's what we, we did. And we got people from India. If you go to Uruguay, you will find a, a lot of Indian people playing cricket. And that was impossible several years ago. Why? Because we developed capacities to expand the software industry in Uruguay, and that's why Indian people came. But you need to analyze your capacities and what you develop in order to attract these people. Thank you very much, everybody. We have to stop here. I'd like to have five minutes uh, to end uh, this session, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Department of uh, Pro Economic Pro Promotion. Thank you to Luis, Yo Jordi, Yolanda, Javier, and all the people who took uh, part in the um, presentation of initiatives. Javier, it's your turn now for the last five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback, for your opinions. Thank you to all participants. Thank you for your questions and reflections. We have enough material here to reflect for a long time. We need to analyze what you have all said. Turkisunairaikis has the vocation of, of being a collaborative space, a vocation to be a center for experimentation and learning. The exercise that we've done here is going to be a learning exercise. But we'll, we'll have another action. It's an exercise of storytelling. Telling what you said, that's what you've done. J Jordi was saying, light it up. Yes, it's difficult to tell. That's what our difficulty. We don't know how to tell, how to story tell what we have. We need to sometimes be more aware that we have a lot of things to, to say. It's the way we are, our personality. We don't give the value to what we have. Normally, what we, we do what we say, which is not very common, in fact, if you look around. So we have credibility. We can tell what we do with humility, with a learning spirit, with a sharing spirit, but every time we take up 
breakfast in the morning, we need to read the post-it. What are you going to tell today? We have to tell what we do. And I think uh, Cynthia was mentioning that it's like a teacher. The teacher is consolidating the knowledge of his or her students. And you see more than just at the beginning of the course, because telling is learning and discovering. We spoke about escalating projects. Javier and Luis mentioned different ways of escalating. Then we, you mentioned leaderships with these short and long-term perspectives. We spoke about innovation and the need to um, innovate if for people and processes. Models of innovation, it's another type of escalation. And to scale up our projects, and that's difficult for us. And this is linked to the idea of telling the story. We need to make a jump forward. You spoke about resilience. And I think that this uh, there are other as aspects like business culture and political culture. I need. I think we need to write it down and to give it va more value, to put it into value. For resilience, I'm sure that the investment culture uh, we mentioned yesterday is important. People reinvest what is gained. The idea is that we normally reinvest in fixed assets and we need to now turn towards the intangible assets. We are, are capitalized companies where we are more resilient and we saw it in 2008. And we are more competitive because we invest in capacities. But in public institutions it's the same. The long-term culture is something that we have to nurture. Because people say that institutions and administrations in resilient times have to be there. Uh, because things change according to cycles, and there are cyclic words. But when the word uh, resilience emerged, people thought, oh, the administration should be counter-cyclical. But to be counter-cyclical in crisis areas means that you have to be counter-cyclical in very good times. In farms, well, there's a part of uh, the vegetables that have to be kept for the winter. So we need to reduce our debt, to adjust to regarding the crisis, because you know the crisis will come, but you don't know when and why, but they will come to us. We also spoke about people. This is the necessary and essential ingredient. We need to invest in people. And our aspiration is that Gipuzkoa is the best place to build and develop our personal and our professional lives. Therefore, I hope well, for us, it was uh, this, this exercise of telling the story. It's a learning exercise, and I hope we will consolidate your feedback, and I hope we will put it into value, and I hope this has contributed to convince you that Gipuzkoa is the best place to live in the world. Thank you. Thank you.